Donald Griffin is joining us this evening. Um, he's the campaign coordinator and the marine policy officer with Fair Seas. Um, and he is going to talk about uh, the motion for the ocean um, that has gone through in a couple of councils in Britain. And he's going to give us an overview of that and how it might be put in place here. Um, he is also going to give an overview of Fair Seas and the Marine Protected Area, um, the MPA bill, and um, that's going through the government at the moment. I'd like to encourage people who are from groups here tonight who aren't a member of the public participation networks, uh, please do sign up. They really need environmental groups and environmental people involved. And um, so if you are a member of any group at all, or if you just have an interest in environmental aspects, you can join one, your group can join the PPN, or you as an individual can join one of the groups who are already a member and get involved that way. They're brilliant for networking, for um, getting local policy in, enacted um, or for having your voice heard in local policy um, and for getting information about what's going on in your county. So with that, I'll hand it over to Donal and uh, thanks a Donal. Thanks everyone for coming along. Um, thanks to Catherine and the PPN for having me give this talk. Um, it's incredibly useful from my and Fair Seas perspective and um, we'll hear a little bit more later on why that is um, our first venture into the um, I guess, ad, or advocacy work venturing into the, the local authority um, and local government level. So um, just to reiter reiterate my thanks to Catherine and the, the team. Um, let's see if I can move my slides here. There we go. Um, so just to thank Catherine as well for my for the introduction. So my name is Dolan Griffin. I'm the Fair Seas Campaign Coordinator. Um, and I'm going to speak today a little bit about Ireland's motion for ocean stewardship. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about what that is. Um, uh, it's a way of um, engaging with local councils on the very important issue of marine conservation in the coastal area, an area on which the local authorities have quite a bit of sway and power and a lot of local decision making can impact on the coastal environment for good and for bad. So um, we see it as a really important um, link in or a really important cog in the whole process of delivering ultimately what fair seas are about healthy seas and that in, that includes right up to the coastline and high water mark for us so um and tonight's uh my slides tonight at least are going to be kind of split up into two two sections really first is giving an overview of what who and what fair seas are what we're about what we want to see and what we're trying to make happen and then I'll get into the detail, more detail then of Ireland's motion for ocean stewardship and a little bit about its origins, the motion for the, the origins of motion for the ocean um, in, in the UK. But first of all, fair sea. So we are a coalition of Ireland's leading uh, marine environmental non-governmental organisations and networks. So um, we're a coalition of NGOs, essentially, and you'll see some of our partners there. Um, and I'm sure you'll recognise some of them. Um, the Irish Whale Trust, Birdwatch Ireland, the Sustainable Water Network, the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group, Kula Salmon Trust, now known as Streamscapes, the Irish Environmental Network and also Coast Watch. And our ambition or our vision is to see Ireland become a leader in marine protection, giving our species, habitats and coastal communities the opportunity to thrive. And that coastal communities aspect is really important. Um, and just to say that we're funded by four uh, international conservation um, grant giving organisations, um, and we're very lucky to have um, one of those grants here in Ireland. They have projects all around the world, and we're very lucky to have uh, the Fair Seas Project in Ireland. Um, so that's Oceans 5, Blue Nature Alliance, Beck Family Charitable Trust and the Weiss Foundation. So thank you very much to them. So I don't know if you know a whole lot else about Fair Seas, but if you've heard us on, on social media or on the airwaves or in print media, you'll have definitely heard us talk about marine protected areas. Um, and I thought it might be a good grounding or basis just to give a quick definition of what a marine protected area is. Um, and this is from the Expanding Ireland's MPA Network Report, which is published in 2020. So a marine protected area, or what I'll now refer to them as MPAs, are a geographically defined area of marine character or influence, which is protected through legal means. And that legal means is quite important. And it's protected through legal means for the purpose of conservation and or restoration of a species, habitats or ecosystem or ecosystems. 
uh, as well as their associated ecosystem services, processes, and cultural values, and manage, and this is another important uh, part of this definition, that they are managed with the intention of achieving stated conservation objectives. So we have an area, it's defined legally, that area, and its purpose is to restore, protect nature, and we do that by um, by interventions working towards a stated conservation goal, essentially. So they're quite simple, but the the way in which they um, they manifest in reality in the world here in Ireland and all around the the globe um, is not always so simple. But that's what they are on paper. And also, if you if you know anything of fair seas, you may have also heard us talk about targets and 30 by 30 targets quite a lot. So the 30 by 30 target globally is a target not specifically to marine. It's a target of achieving 30 percent of land and sea in a protected area by 2030. Um, and but when it comes to marine, which is fair seas um, focus, Ireland has already committed to designating 30% of its seas in a protect in a marine protected area by 2030. And it's done that at a national level through the program for government and really multiple government announcements and speeches ever since. Um, it's committed to 30 by 30 at sea at a European level through the EU biodiversity strategy, also the EU Commission MPA pledge um process at the EU. Um They've done that as well. And also globally through the Kunming Montreal Agreement under the UN Convention of Biological Biodiversity or the CBD COP15 back in December 2022. That Ireland was one of the signatory countries to that um to that agreement, which also um commits to 30 by 30. So it's very clear where Ireland wants to be with regards to marine protected area. They've made the commitments at pretty much every achievable level um uh, uh, at the moment. But that's a commitment. But where are we in terms of implementation? So I just thought that this slide would give us an idea of the progress so far. So back in 2019, so doesn't seem all that like that long ago, but it was five years ago now, we had 2.3% of Ireland's waters designated as a marine protected area. And that's the map on your left. And the yellow, um, th those yellow boxes are all different marine protected areas. So predominantly, Special Areas of Conservation, SACs, or Special Protection Areas, SPAs, and they are all designated through EU law, the Habitats and Birds Directive. Uh, so fast forward five years to present day, and we have just over 9% of Ireland's waters designated as an MPA, and that's the middle map there with the green. Um, so you can see visually just by first glance that there's a little bit more colour on that map. Um, so in terms of designation, that the spatial coverage you know, going from 2.3% to over 9% is quite good uh, in a relatively short period of time. It's really, really the bulk of that has happened over this past 24 months. Um, but then, of course, designation and that space of coverage is only one one part of the story. And I talk about, and Fair Seas talks about, the quantity of MPAs, but also the quality of MPAs. And I'll come back to that um, in, a little, in a little while. Uh, so... We're at just under 10% at the moment, but the commitment by 2030 is 30%. So that still leaves two thirds of the work to be done in you know less, you know, less than six years at the moment. So how is the government proposing to actually meet that gap? And they're proposing to meet that gap by introducing marine protected area legislation. Um, this is new national marine protected area legislation. So this would allow Ireland to designate new MPA sites um unilaterally you know by themselves without having to use eu mechanisms and that's something that er, that um that fair seas absolutely supports and it's something very common actually across europe uh, for country member states to have their own national mechanism to designate uh, a national mpa as it is all around the world so that i think that's encouraging um er, it's it's um it's an indictment on ireland that we don't have that capability already to be honest in my view um, so the timeline for Ireland's new MPA legislation, so back in 2022, at the end of that year, the MPA bill, so this was the bill for the new legislation, that the general scheme of that bill was published. So that's essentially a, um, a detailed contents page, is what, how I kind of describe it, a fleshed out contents page. It's It gives you a little bit of detail, it kind of indicates what's going to be, what the government are intending 
for to be in the bill, but it doesn't give you the whole doesn't give you the whole piece, and it's not the bill itself. The bill at that stage had still yet to be drafted. So, and then quickly in January, February of twenty twenty three. So when the Oireachtas came back in mid January, there was pre legislative scrutiny of that general scheme by the Joint Oireachtas Committee for the Department of Housing, Local Government, and Heritage. That's the the department with responsibility for this. Um, and the the there were forty five recommendations published by that committee, and fair seas fed into that process as well. So that was great. So it was a big flurry of activity last year, the beginning of last year on this, and we were very encouraged by it all. Um, and since then, not so encouraged actually. There hasn't been from outside looking in. There hasn't been a whole lot happened. We despite various, and you can see it there. Look through them all. There's been three or four missed deadlines now. Um, we still the bill still isn't published. Um, the latest deadline was Easter of twenty twenty four, so just a few weeks ago, and um, it wasn't published before then, and there's still no sign of it. And the government, I guess, understandably now, aren't putting a target on their back by giving us a, a dead another deadline. Um, but we're we're fair seas are working as hard as we can to campaign and advocate and advocate for for that bill to be published and progress as soon as possible. Um, so we're no for, so as I said, outside looking in, we're no further forward, but of course we do know from speaking with department officials and various ministers and, um, and, and different people that the, the government have been drafting the bill, which to be fair, what does take a little bit of time and we know it's going to be a big bill in terms of its length pages. Uh, we know that it's a complex bill in terms of what it's trying to do. Um, and how it interacts with other laws and how it interacts with the EU element, such as the common fisheries policy that kind of governs how fishing, how we manage fishing in Ireland. So there, apparently there has been, there's been quite a lot of progress in that. And it's nearly it's nearly ready, is what we're told, and that there are a few uh, technical and legal issues now that they're resolving. And once they are resolved, it'll be published, you know, as soon as it can be. Um, so, you know, taking the government's word for it, that's that is encouraging. Um, and again, that won't, you know, that's we're 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 campaigning as hard as we can to make sure that does happen and that these issues are resolved as quickly as possible. So there's been delay after delay after delay, I guess. And why is that, you know, is that a problem? And the Pharisees argue that it is because while these delays have been happening, marine biodiversity continues to decline because there's been report after report and an, an assessment and more surveys and research to show uh, and more of the same at, at all sorts of levels, national level, um, the international level, the Northeast Atlantic OSPAR level, um, you know, the again, the national level when it comes to birds, all these reports of, of very different kinds coming from very different places, policy places, academia places, um, state agency places, they're all saying much the same thing. And it could be summed up as saying that marine biodiversity is under pressure, uh, it's under threat, it's having a negative impact on various, many uh, species, populations, um, habitats. And ultimately what we are doing to combat that isn't enough. What we are doing to stop the, the decline of biodiversity uh, and the loss of biodiversity isn't enough. And marine protected areas, effective marine protected areas, that the quantity and the quality aspects um, uh, is, is how we stem the, the loss of, bi of biodiversity at sea. And it's not the whole piece. It's not the whole thing. It's not the only way we, we can stem that or prevent that loss but it's a critical piece of the puzzle. And without it, I don't think we have a chance, but with it and with it, with other measures we do. Um, but so that, that's, that's our take on why this is so important. And just to come back then quickly, I said um, about the, the, the quality of our marine protected area network so far. Um, and unfortunately it's our assessment that it's it, the quality of our current MPA network is not good. That's, as I said earlier, predominantly SACs and SPAs under EU law, or what we know, what, what we refer to as the Natura 2000 network at sea. Um, on June 29th last year, the European Court, um, or the, the Commission took Ireland to, to court, and the European Court um, declared that Ireland has 
failed to fulfill its obligations under Article 4 and Article 6 of the Habitats Directive. And it went on to say then there has been a failure by Ireland to properly designate Natura 2000 sites or MPAs. That's as land and sea this is referring to. There's failure to set site specific conservation objectives. And that's a core important piece of any successful MPA is having site specific conservation objectives. And also there has been a fail. Well, it makes sense then if you don't have site specific conservation objectives, it makes sense that there there was has been no implementation of necessary of the necessary conservation measures to bring about a site into good status either. So that's uh, that's a systematic. I think that the some of the words used by the 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 ruling was that it was a systematic failure. So I mean that's just one example. There are other examples, but I think that just sums up quite neatly. How maybe they are, or we have a lot of work to do, not only to reach the thirty percent that I talked about, but actually to make sure that even if we we stay at nine percent for the next six years, um, that they they actually deliver what they're supposed to deliver for nature, and that they actually protect what they're designed to protect. So, and what Affair Seas have been doing? So we're an evidence based campaign, um, and we've been going now for um, two, over two years, actually. Um, and we have produced a series of reports. And these reports are designed to inform the debate around MPAs and to, um, and to guide uh, um, with how, to guide how they should be, how MPAs should be progressed in Ireland based on be, be, um, best uh, practice around the world. Um, our latest report there on the left, A Climate Resilient Path for Ireland's Marine Protected Area Network. That's a fantastic report with, coll with collaborators in Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK, um, undertook a study to, to highlight the areas in which um, are beneficial for biodiversity by protecting them now, but what but would still be beneficial to by, by to biodiversity under varying degrees and of scenarios of, of climate change, so that we can be we can future proof and climate proof our marine protected area network essentially. Then we also have the Sustainable Financing Ireland's MPA network report that we published last uh, autumn. It's about how well this is going to cost a bit of money, of course. This is a big piece of work from government. How are we going to pay for it? And, you know, that was to inform the debate and to give, essentially to give the government no excuses. You know, we know what to do. We know we can finance it. You know, why are you not getting on with it is the question we would ask government then. And then just very quickly, ocean literacy and coastal connections in Ireland, that was to kind of get a grasp and get a feeling of how, people in Ireland feel about our, about the sea, how they feel about marine protected areas, um, the benefits they get from the sea um, and how they use the sea. It was a, it's a really fantastic piece of work there. Again, we had collaborators to help us with all these reports. And then our original report, Revitalizing Our Seas, was our first report we published on World Ocean Day in 2022. It identified areas of interest for marine protected area designation in Ireland. And that's, again, us trying to start to, to and that's based on biodiversity, where the biodiversity is in our seas. Um, that's really us trying to inform the conversation on, on, on marine protected areas and to kind of lead on these important issues, these things that the government will have to get to grasp um, we'll have to we'll have to get the to, to grips with um in the next few years if they're going to actually achieve the 30 by 30 targets um and just very lastly and we have also been busy in terms of our campaign work and advocacy work and we have a uh an online petition at the moment um and i encourage you all to scan the qr code there and sign if you if you haven't already um we actually have over twenty thousand iris signatures now um and and from Ireland, um, which is quite a few, uh, it was quite a good number, um, and we're um, there are actually fit over fifty thousand signatures worldwide, um, so there's a huge appetite in Ireland. There's a huge huge appetite worldwide actually for Ireland to get this right and to to do it right, and we'll um we'll have more news to to come on our petition. Um, that ask will soon turn into sending uh, Dara Minister Dara O'Brien a letter, and next week um we hope to launch a contact your minister tool so that people can if they like. Can um can send a a, a letter quickly to Minister O'Brien, uh, urging him to get on with the this important bill and this important um piece of legislation. Um, 
And I'm just checking the time here. Um, I'll very quickly go through this and then we'll get on to the motion for ocean stewardship. So Ireland's new MPA legislation from Fair Seas perspective must include well, three, well, we have quite a long list of things that we want, but they can be summed up really in these three asks. Number one, we want ambitious and binding targets to effectively protect 30% of our MCs as MPAs by 2030. So that's what I talked about there, the quantity and the quality of these sites. We also want a target of 10% strictly protected. So these are areas that are given the gold standard, the top tier of environmental protections to afford really sensitive areas or really vulnerable areas the greatest um, the greatest degree of protection. And we also know that strictly protected areas are some of the most effective MPAs from all around the world, going by the evidence. Um, number two, we want a robust management framework, which clearly defines what will be protected, how it will be protected, the responsible government authorities for implementation and management. And I guess that's where the local authority um, piece comes in as well. And we'll speak to that in, in, in a few seconds. And then thirdly, and this is another really important aspect that Fair Seas are quite strong on, I feel like. So from the very beginning, we've been calling on community engagement, stakeholder engagement at every stage of the MPA designation and management process when it comes to MPAs. And that engagement should be based on transparency, inclusiveness and fairness among local, regional and national stakeholders. So that's our that's a summary of what we want uh, the, the new bill to reflect. So... That brings us on to the Ireland's motion for ocean stewardship. Um, and this, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, has its origins in um, in England um, and it has grown from England to, to, to around the rest of the UK, I guess. Um, and also has their, their, their exploring uh, motion for the ocean in parts of Europe. And now I guess with, with fair seas in Ireland now as well. Um, Oh, I've actually got the slides the wrong way around. So I'm going to go to this one first and then go to that little video. So the motion for the ocean, what is it? Um, so the motion for the ocean is a local government declaration or motion that can be brought forward in a local in a local government um setting chamber. Um, and it outlines how local authorities will and acknowledges how local authorities will or can play their part in realizing a clean, healthy, and productive ocean as well as highlighting the direct economic health and well-being benefits it will bring to local communities and their constituents. And the first motion of the ocean, as, I, as we mentioned, was debated and passed in Plymouth City Council in England in November 2021. Um, it's interesting, actually, there, last week the government announced um, the Ireland's first ever marine national park um, uh, off the Kerry, off the Kerry coast, off the Dingle, um, Ever Peninsula, and Plymouth is actually was the first ever mar marine national park in um in the UK, um. So that that's just an interesting observation. Um, the motion for the ocean was originally written by Dr. Pamela Buchan, a marine social scientist specialising in marine citizenship, who I've met a couple of times, and a good friend of mine, Emily, Emily Cunningham. Um, who was actually supposed to give us a was be here tonight with us, but um, had a prior engagement, unfortunately. But she did say if there's any questions that I can't handle later on, which may be the case, um, we can uh, I, I can pass them on to her and she can get back to us. Um, Emily sends her apologies. So she's a marine conservation specialist and former lead officer of the local government association, so the uh, UK version of the LGA Coastal Special Interest Group. Um, so that's a with a of the coastal focus in the, among the local local authorities, which is great. And also, lastly, Nicola Bridge. So she was the head of ocean advocacy and engagement at the Ocean Conservation Trust. And since then, back in 2021, 25 other councils across England and Wales have adopted similar motions for the better protection and stewardship of the sea. And the motion for ocean has also been explored in parts of Europe as well. I think I mentioned that. So I'm just gonna go back a slide now and I'm going to play just a couple of minutes of this short video just to give you a better appreciation and then get into the detail of Ireland's ocean for motion for ocean stewardship so give me a thumbs up Catherine if you can hear and this plays okay hi everyone my name is Nicola Bridge and I'm head of ocean advocacy and engagement for the Ocean Conservation Trust and I'm here because I've got some really great news if you want to take action for the ocean today We've been working with some fantastic colleagues over the past few months to ask local councils in the UK to declare an urgent need for ocean recovery. 
What we mean by this is that in local councils, councillors will agree to work together to make decisions to ensure that the ocean is healthy for the future. So to tell us a little bit more, here's Dr Pam Buchan. Okay, so the Ocean Recovery Declaration is a way for people to be marine citizens, which means that they can get involved in shaping how we as people use the marine environment and the ocean. Marine citizenship means taking some responsibility for the marine environment and also um, exercising what we call rights, so having the right to be involved in shaping how we use the marine environment. So the motion is designed for local councils because though lots of decisions are made at national government level, local councils also have responsibility for quite a lot of things that are happening in their area. So things like they have a big budget and they can choose how to spend that money. And things like planning, which is how the land is used, so they can make decisions about that. So the motion is aimed at local councils so that they can think about ocean recovery and the health of the marine environment when they're making their decisions. Councillors can get involved by using the model motion. So this is like a template for the Ocean Recovery Declaration and councillors can use that to adapt and make it suitable for their council and then they can ask their fellow councillors in a full council meeting to declare an urgent need for ocean recovery. It's really good to think about the difference between coastal and inland councils because they have responsibilities that are different. So a council by the sea might have things to do with what's called shoreline management plans, which is about managing the coastline, whereas inland councils don't have that. However, the health of the ocean is really important for everybody in the whole world, wherever you live. And inland councils also have responsibilities um, and actions that affect the sea. So for example, we use the phrase source to sea, which recognises that things that go into the rivers at source eventually end up in the sea. So inland councils, and if you're a resident in an inland council, you can ask them still to do the Ocean Recovery Declaration because it recognises that source to sea problem. Hey there, so um, that gives you a, a, a little bit of a taster, I guess, what what the the motion for the ocean is uh, in the uk and you can watch the rest of that video we can we can send out the link later on it's very easy to find online if you just type into youtube our ocean recovery motion um it gets a bit more techy into the 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 english um way of of sorry the the english model um but that gives you an idea of how it's been used before and how maybe it could how it could be used here in Ireland. So I'll go to my next slide now if I can. Let me okay, we did that one. So this is it really. Um when we talk about Ireland's motion for ocean stewardship at the moment. Um it's just one page. It's very simple. It's quite brief. Um and it's we've set it up in a similar way in that this text here is a template and it can be adopted and taken by a councillor or a councils or a coalition of councillors or what have you um and uh, amended and made fit for purpose for their for their area um and i think that's right and we're and fair seas are happy to talk to any councillors or anyone about this in fact um but especially councillors that are interested in progressing this in their in their local authority in their local government um and i'm just and really it's split up into two two sections really the first three short uh paragraphs there um is kind of the the council recognizing i guess the need and the urgency for delivering healthy seas and the 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 importance of that not just for biodiversity but for uh coastal communities the blue economy um for lots of different things and then the second part of it there from the from um um, halfway down the the numbers there is is what this the the motion is proposing that the council do um it says commits you know here but maybe commits isn't the right word because a motion doesn't commit a, a local you know a local council to do anything it's just a motion it's a declaration of intent or of feeling on an issue you know yeah, there are lots of motions for lots of different things regarding lots of different issues 
um and they can they can be local and sometimes um i know certainly up north here where i'm living um motions are used um to signify the council's um o feeling or overall fe feeling on issues as far away as 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 foreign policy issues you might say that don't that local gov councils themselves have no impact but of course this when it comes to marine protected areas local government and local councils do and can have an impact impact so we feel like it's it's hyper relevant so i'm just going to quickly if you bear with me i'm just going to quickly go through the first little um the first half and the second half of this to just to, to get into the the details of it of what exactly uh, a motion for ocean stewardship is uh, should someone wish to to take it on so first um the first paragraph there the council recognizes that we need to protect and restore the marine environment including the seabirds cetaceans and other fauna and flora that flora they call it home to help tackle the interlinked biodiversity and climate crises and to foster a movement of ocean stewardship in ireland and well-managed and effective marine protected areas are a core tool in which to achieve this. The Council acknowledges the important role that healthy and productive marine ecosystems play in successful and vibrant coastal communities and in supporting the blue economy in Ireland. And we feel like that's a really important element of this, um, especially at this local level. And the Council stresses the important role and responsibility of local government in tackling both the biodiversity and climate crises. This includes action to protect and restore the coastal and marine environment upon which our constituents' livelihoods, businesses, tourism, recreation, tradition, culture and well-being rely. And again, that's a really important element of this as well. Um, it's not just about biodiversity, although biodiversity will get will gain the benefit of, uh, of positive action. Um, but we all benefit from positive action to save biodiversity. Um, and that's something that we should all, that Fair Seas are certainly keen to, to highlight. Um, and just then the second element of this then is the the, the commitments. Um, so number one, um, the council will commit to embedding the principles of marine stewardship and nature-based solutions into all strategic decision and decision-making processes in line with national government policy regarding the management and use of marine resources. Ensuring that local planning processes and decisions support ocean stewardship and working closely with relevant state agencies uh, for the effective protection and restoration of marine biodiversity. And we've included the National Parks and Wildlife Service there and Board Panola, MARA, the newly set up MARA but there are others as well. Working with partners locally and nationally to promote local marine industries and blue economy blue economy activities that deliver positive marine biodiversity outcomes and growing ocean literacy in the council area, including through increased support for marine and environmental education, awareness events, opportunities and engagement. And then finally, the one that's, that's specific to and aligns with the Fair Seas ask regarding marine protected areas, um, prioritizing a strong marine protected area law. Sorry, I should say that the council commits to writing to the government, asking it to prioritize a strong marine protected area law and to quickly engage, guide and adequately resource local coastal councils and how they can best input into forthcoming MPA site selection, management and monitoring processes, specifically calling for, and um, that's a repeat there of the, the key ask that I went through a little while ago for Fair Seas, for ambitious MPA legislation, robust management framework and principles and high quality stakeholder engagement. So taken together, um, it's it's highlighting, as I said, the, the 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 role in which local government and authorities have in delivering and achieving healthy seas. And then uh, there's some uh, some actions there, I guess, that are based around that and some commitments um, to have the, the health of our, our, our seas and our, the health of our coast um, high up the priority um, of local councils and coast, coastal councils. But also, as we heard in that video there, the inland councils ha have a role in this as well. And I should say that, and I was talking to Catherine just before we come on, that this is Fair Sea's first venture into the this this level of advocacy at this local level. We have had events in local areas, and we've we've been talking to lots of different councillors, and uh, councillors have spoken at our events. Um, we've replied to some climate action plan and some biodiversity action plan uh, consultations at that local council level as well. 
um, and we've engaged in lots of different ways, but it's been much more light touch than, for example, the motion for ocean stewardship here. Um, and this is our foray now into making this local element, this local council element, a much stronger part of the the conversation. Because I think it's really important there in number five, the aspect is calling on the government to make clear exactly what the official role would be for councils in the rollout of marine protected areas. Um, and and from my perspective, that local councils, coastal councils are absolutely key stakeholders when it comes to, to coastal MPAs. Um, so whatever process is rolled out over the next few years to expand Ireland's MPA network on the coast, then you know local councils need to be at the table, um, same as all the other important stakeholders. So then my, I think it's coming up to my last slide, you'll be uh, happy to hear. Um, so the next steps, um, let me, oh, there, twist it around. Um, so raise public awareness about Ireland's motion for ocean stewardship. And this is our, this is our launch, I guess, in a way. So thank you again, Catherine. Um, we have, we've done lots of work on this over the past six months, but this is our first um, putting it out in there into the world. Um, and we're very acutely aware that there are elections coming up, um, you know, in, in, in a, a lot of weeks time, really. Um, so after those elections, um, we will be targeting coastal councils and councillors, not just coastal councils, but um, a priority will be coastal councils um, to seek champions in the councils and councillors to pioneer the first ever motion for ocean stewardship in Ireland and where can that be passed, you know, hopefully somewhere um, soon. Um, and we think that um, while this kind of strange period just before an election may at first seem like not a great time to actually launch to talk about these things, it actually, the more I've thought about it, it is the perfect time to talk about it because all, all the local councillor candidates, you know, they'll be knocking on doors, They'll be asking for votes. They'll be asked what their issues are. You know, what we want is for um is for people to to open the door to them, those canvassers, and ask the question, you know, well, what about our seas? What are you going to do to help protect um our, our coasts and our seas and our local communities? Um and we want, you know, the motion for ocean stewardship. Motion for ocean stewardship, we want healthy seas. We want effective marine protected areas to be on the tops of, of, of people's heads and on the tips of people's tongues. Um, so we're we're happy to, and from now on, I should also say, we're happy to speak to anyone and everyone um, about this. Um, this. But to be clear, this is something that councillors that we believe need to grasp and take on as their own. Uh, to forward obviously they're the ones that can forward this in, in a council and that in the way that we we are suggesting but we are absolutely happy to work with any councillors to to speak to them um to to talk to them about how it could be adapted to their local area um and how it could be made better um and how you know how this can evolve because it's very much an evolving thing it's not we don't envisage, envisage it as a static thing at all um and we hope that it takes on a bit of a life of its own so Guru Moghav, thanks everyone. Thanks for listening. Um and I'll I'm happy to answer any questions as best I can.